members that include government. Sorry. Oh, no, I smack people in. <laughs> that, that include government agencies and community partners for the commitment to work together to enhance services for youth, for families, and communities. Together, we really have uh, made a difference and continue to make a difference in improving the, the delivery of services. Uh, Eduardo, is Deputy Commissioner Denise Williams with us? Um, she, she is scheduled. I don't know if she's in the room as of now, but I did okay. see uh, Assistant Commissioner Randy Scott also. Okay. So first, I want to actually, I'm glad you rent. I want to thank Randy Scott and, and Tracy Thorne um, for their efforts. The ICC, I mean, they have been doing terrific work, um, leading the way, helping runaway and homeless youth, helping LGBT plus youth, um, and really have stepped up their work re recently. So Randy, I know you want to say a few words to the ICC. Thank you, Andrew. Um, yes, it's it's been a pleasure to serve as one of the co-chairs for um, the ICC work groups. You know, we've been able to collaborate, um, discuss, and um, in some instances implement a lot of effective and great change across the various city agencies on, um, to work with the folks that we work with, you know, whether it's um, youth, whether it's um, the elder, um, folks or uh, other. And it's just been a pleasure to have the ability to have such a, uh, a group that can come together and talk about the issues and see how we can grow as a city and work together. Because as you know, this is probably the first for a lot of city agencies where they get to, um, the opportunity to talk to this the different um, sister agencies within the city. So I just wanted to say it's been great. I look forward to continuing to grow ICC to to the best of our ability and working with all of you um, to make that happen. So again, I appreciate all of you and I thank you and I look forward to today's public hearing. Well, and thank you, Randy. And, and, and he's bashful, but he's really done outstanding work actually um, developing the, our portfolio of runaway homeless youth services. We went from 253 beds eight years ago. Where are we at now, Randy? Over 800? Yeah, we're over 800, eight, over 800 beds right now. We have eight drop-in centers, five of which are 24 hours uh, throughout the city that can work with youth ages 14 to 24. So um, it's it's a great it's a great thing. We have over 50 sites within the five boroughs. So. And now so we, we serve up to age 24. So it's uh -huh. great work. And I look forward to continue to work with you on enhancing services to the, this you know, vulnerable population of young people. Same here, same here. I also wanna recognize uh, Deputy Commissioner Susan Haskell and her staff in particular, I know they're on, Paula Calby and Celinda Wu for all their support. And they have been with us every step of the way and brought their commitment and level of expertise to our efforts. I also wanna thank our, uh, our coach, Eduardo Laboy for his guidance, his leadership and support, and to bring really bringing the ICC to the next level. Eduardo, you mentioned you were with the ICC now 18 years? That That's correct, very long time, yes, thank you. And most of the time I've worked with you, I used to be chief of staff of DJJ, and that's actually where Remember. I got to meet Eduardo and know what the ICC is about. I think we grew leaps and bounds since then, so thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, appreciate that, Andrew. The ICC also has the beneficiary of working with some amazing MSW graduate students this academic year from Fordham University and New York NYU. And they're somehow working remote most of the time. We have Tom Lawless, Tim Manning, Maria Kurvan, and Ho Yang Wang, who really bring their unique um, talents to work and allow us to navigate the challenge brought about, brought about by the pandemic. So thank you guys for everything you do. We also want to recognize Dr. O, and I saw it was on the slideshow, so thank you for including him. Um, we really have benefited from his leadership, and he actually passed away earlier this year, unfortunately. You know, he inspired many individuals, both inside and outside of government, and has led the ICC's court-involved work group for more than a decade. He was really is sorely missed, but his impact will be lived on in the and in, 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 live on, and he's embodied the definition of collaboration. And actually it was already um, on the slide, but we're very proud that on December 16th, we'll be renaming a conference room in his honor. Uh, Eduardo could send you the details, um, but we will have that ceremony on Zoom. And now I'm gonna ask for
for the ICC member agencies to unmute themselves and introduce themselves. I guess we could start in alphabetical order with ACS. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marissa Morin. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm the director of interagency affairs with the with um, Administration for Children's Services, or ACS. And ACS is responsible for maintaining the safety and well being of New York City children and families. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my colleague Sasha, who is here with us today, and we are looking forward to hearing all of your testimony. Tifta? Good afternoon. I'm Helen Flowers, um, the director of the Grandparent Resource Center at the New York City Department for the Aging. And we pretty much provide services for grandparents who are providing care or kinship caregivers who are providing care for youth. Um, well, I'm also looking forward to hearing um, your perspective and things on, on ways that we can improve to support you. Thank you. Thank you. DCAS. Eric Terry is here. I did see him earlier. Okay. I don't know if he's having any technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Terry. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Terry Denson. I'm the direct, direct, de deputy director for the Public Service Corps program under DCAS. We're responsible for placing interns in undergrad and under and graduate interns in internships with in city agencies. Uh, unfortunately, my director, Anika Hilton, cannot be with us today, but I look forward to the testimony. Thank you. Department of Correction. Good afternoon. Um, I am Stacy King. I'm the Executive Director for Educational Services for the Department of Correction. Um, I thank you for having me back once again, um, and I look forward to hearing from the youth of our city. Thank you. Department of Cultural Affairs. Good afternoon. I'm Claudia Arzeno. I'm a Program Officer at the Department of Cultural Affairs. As our name says, we fund cultural organizations around New York City. I really look forward to hearing all your testimony. Thank you. Department of Education. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Rosa. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships. Uh, the DOE is very big, but I'm part of the Office of Community Schools, um, which is an equity strategy to organize resources and share leadership so that there's academic health and youth development supports for young people and their families. Looking forward to this meeting. And we really appreciate your partnership, particularly this summer when we launched brand new initiatives. It was terrific, so thank you. Department of Environmental uh, Protection. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robin Sanchez. I'm the Director of Education within uh, the DEP's Bureau of Public Affairs and Communications. Excited to be here today. Um, and our mission is to engage students and educators um, in helping to shine light on the work that DEP does to protect public health and the environment for New Yorkers. Thank you. Um, the fire department. Yes, good afternoon. This is uh, Fabricio Caro, Director of Community Affairs for the New York City Fire Department. Um, community affairs within the FDNY basically oversees all levels of public engagement uh, dealing with all uh, 59 community boards and specifically working with uh, youth and community development and, and schools as well in terms of engaging and enhancing uh, uh, fire and life safety efforts as a way to basically provide or, to, or promote uh, prevention efforts throughout the city. Terrific. Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'm not sure if they've connected as of yet, Andrew. Health and Hospitals. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amir Holland. I'm a project manager with um, the Adolescent Health Program at New York City Health and Hospitals. Um, one of our main focuses is youth engagement. So I'm really happy to be here and um, get some feedback from the youth. All right, thank you. Department of Social Services. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Polino with the Department of Social Services, also representing the Department of Homeless Services and Human Resources Administration. Uh, we're glad to be here with our fellow partner agencies and look forward to hearing the testimonies this afternoon. Thank you. The Housing Authority. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Judy Boyce. I'm the manager for resident engagement for all of our developments. <laughs> and we work very closely with our youth. So this is very important to us. Thank you. Department of Parks and Recreation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Loretta Sun. I work as a strategic program manager um, at the Office of Programming and Strategic Management for our 36 recreation centers, and we oversee all of the after school um, and summer camp programs, as well as all the youth sports programs for parks. And I believe my colleague Danette is on. She wants to introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Danette Leininger. I also coordinate uh, the sports programs for MS. I'm having difficulties hearing. I did hear it. It was a little faint, but I did make it out. Is this any better? Much, yeah, that's a lot, much you. better. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Danette Leininger. I coordinate uh, citywide sports in the same office that Loretta's in. And uh, so we deal with uh, our sports education and basically all youth programming. Great. Thank you. Thank you. The police department. I did see a representative on the call. I don't know if he's still with us. They are scheduled to be here today. Okay. I don't sure. know if they are now. And are people busy schedules are hopping on and off. Uh, Department of Probation. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cynthia Allman. Uh, I am from the Department of Probation. I believe I am one of the newer members here to the ICC. So thank you so much for having me. And I absolutely look forward uh, to everything that I'm going to glean from this committee. Welcome. Welcome. And now from our uh, non-governmental partners, but nonetheless very important, uh, the Brooklyn Public Library. Hi, I am Karen Keyes. I am the coordinator of Young Adult Services at Brooklyn Public Library, and I oversee programs and services for teens at our 60 branches. And this is one of my favorite things that I do all year, so I'm happy to be here. Great, thank you and welcome. The New York Public Library. Good afternoon, all. My name is Jordan Manguel, and I'm the Young Adult Educational Programming Coordinator for NYPL. Um, I help support programming for teens between the ages of 12 to 18 for the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island. And I'm super excited to be here today and hear the testimonials. Thank you. Uh, the Queens Public Library. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Malinuk. I'm the coordinator of teen services for the Queens Public Library. Um, I am also responsible for the services and programs we provide for teens in our 62 locations. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing your testimonies. Thank you. The law, de the law Department. Good afternoon. My name is Cecilia Williams. I'm the Director of Interagency and External Affairs for the Family Court Division of the New York City Law Department. And the Law Department promotes the well being of the city's children through the Interstate Child Support and Juvenile Delinquency Unit. In addition to supporting uh, children and families in New York City, we also seek to protect the general public through diversion and prosecution of cases involving young people, making sure they're connected to community resources for rehabilitation. And we're always pleased to be here and to hear from New York City youth and make sure that we are aware of all resources that can be, uh, that they can be connected to. So glad to be here. Great, thank you. The uh, Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. Hi there, I'm Gabriel, an educator from the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, and I am honored to be back. Welcome, welcome. And then finally, actually, I'm glad to see in the chat, um, the NYPD actually says that they're having technical difficulties on their end. So we have Sergeant Santos and Police mm -hmm. Officer D Domenico from the Community Affairs Nico. Unit. So we're D very D glad that they yeah. joined us. We actually did important work with the NYPD earlier this summer. 
we actually, as you know, we have Discover DYCD, which is a, 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 a app, an app on the phone where you can find DYCD services throughout the five boroughs and actually um, sign up for the services. And it, it's now on every single police officer's phone. So that was no okay. small feat. Thank the NYPD for their for all their efforts in that regard. Great. So the importance of the ICC. As you know, the ICC was founded in 1989. And I, Eduardo, I think you've worked most of those times. So <laughs> Just about. <laughs> and yeah, and it's a New York City uh, charter mandated uh, agency and it's promoted interagency collaboration for over 32 years. And you know, this will be the last ICC hearing of the de Blasio administration. So it's interesting to know that the ICC, and I don't know how Eduardo managed all this, the ICC has held 110 meetings and trainings throughout those eight years. So congratulations, Eduardo. It's incredible Thank work. You. Appreciate and it. Thank you. This year alone in, in May, and again, this is you know during the shutdown and with COVID, in May, the ICC held a remote legal training designed for staff to support clients that may be involved in the legal system. And it highlighted uh, the various stages of justice engagement and its corresponding implications. In June, members of the ICC completed the annual LGBTQ plus competency training. And we've been doing that with the center for what, the past 10 years at water, correct? 10 years, that's correct. Wow, awesome. And we were, we were on top of this issue. We were cutting edge. So again, great work. Uh, in September, the ICC featured a screening of several short films developed by young people that um, competed in this year's DYCD Film Festival. Members also heard from the Department of Cultural Affairs Department of Consumer and Worker Protection and DCAS on their programming and services for youth, families, and communities. And then in October, the ICC held its monthly meeting, which featured the topic of domestic violence as part, part of Domestic Violence Awareness Month and included pr presentations from the Early Relationship Abuse Prevention Program, it's known as Early RAP, the One Love Foundation and the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based uh, Violence. And then finally in November, the ICC meeting featured the topics of RHY as part of Runaway and Homeless Youth Awareness Month. So thank you, that was a very highly successful uh, year we've had. So now we're gonna begin the testimony portion of our program. So the ground rules are, individuals will be called in the order that they register. I actually have a list here. Uh, we ask that testifiers limit their uh, testimony to three minutes to speak. Um, please note all those that did not register prior to the hearing, but would like to testify can do so after all registered testifiers have spoken. If you wanna do that, kindly identify yourself in the chat box with your full name and organization affiliation to be called upon. I'm gonna jump on in here. Okay, so, Edward, are all of us, like most of the testifiers here or? Uh, yeah, I saw uh, Kevin, which is number two. You might want to start right on the very top with the first individual that registered. Sure. Uh, Aiden Hadzimos from Youth Action. Hi, thank you. Um, should I start now? Yeah. Sure. Um, my name is Aiden Hadzimos, and I'm a senior at the New York City Lab School for Collaborative Studies. I'm here to talk about college and career readiness because I've seen the negative effects of students who are unprepared for college and the workforce. High school should not only be preparing students for their college experience, but they should also be preparing them for the workforce. The transition from full-time student to the workforce is incredibly difficult and one that should not be taken lightly by our school system. Prioritizing and investing in programs that provide college and career support to students is crucial in helping young people build experience and find new opportunities. While about 80% of students in the city graduate from high school, only 57% are deemed college ready. In line with other educational disparities, low income communities and neighbor, low income communities and communities of color experience serious boundaries to college readiness, with rates in some neighborhoods falling below 40%. Meanwhile, in wealthier, whiter districts, we see rates of college readiness at 75 to 80%. Um, in order to support college and career readiness, New York City must expand and invest in college now, creating greater integration in New York City public schools with the CUNY system, ensure that every school has adequate funding for advanced placements and regents courses, college preparation and guidance counselors. Three, increase student and family awareness of FAFSA and other financial aid opportunities such as TAP, 
CUNY ASAP, and Excelsior programs. Four, create universal youth development opportunities, such as internships, sports leadership programs for year-round year learning that are holistic, culturally responsive, and expose youth to different fields. Five, experience year-round youth employment opportunities, such as internships, um, uh, uh, including making the summer youth employment program universal. Six, expand and strengthen partnerships with local companies to provide youth with career opportunities and work alongside companies to make sure they can effectively support the needs of the young people they are hiring. And seven, continue to strengthen and expand pipelines for young people to access green jobs and jobs in the technology sector. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And I, I could say from DYC's perspective, right on, um, we've been doing a lot of efforts in that regard in terms of the Summer Youth Employment Program. This year we served nearly 75,000 young people. And you were talking about the year-round programming. We also do the Work, Learn, and Grow initiative. So I know that there's much work to do and um, many challenges for the next administration. We look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. I don't know if any other agency wants to say anything. What's Hi, Aiden. I want to say that I definitely agree, and we've been coordinating and collaborating with QACD on some of these efforts and agree with you that it needs to be universal and um, inclusive of all. Um, so we will be continuing to work and develop some of these um, programs. Hey, Rick, Kitson, are you down at Ms. Tony's? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Can uh, please uh, put yourself on chat until called upon? Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rosa. Okay, thank you. Next, our good friend, Kevin Kuros. It's always good to see you, Kevin. Hello, good afternoon. Good to see you as well. Um, first, I'd like to say, you know, my condolences on our recent loss of uh, Dr. Osorio. That was a tremendous impact to me. Uh, he was a huge mentor to me and actually the first person who brought me to the meeting um, because Many years ago, I walked into the DYCD building. I Googled board meeting and I just walked in and um, Dr. Osorio was fortunate enough to be there and introduced me to the ICC and I've been um, a member since. So I know COVID has been very difficult for programming. <clears throat> you know, I lost my job because of that. Um, a lot of people did. Youth suffered probably the worst. Violence has gone up. Education rates are getting lower. And there's a lot of trauma that's in our communities and we need some healing. Um, so I love that we have this collaboration because I am a person who was severely impacted and neglected by the system and the state of New York when my parents were deported at the age, of, when I was eight and I was left homeless. But fortunately, I, uh, you know, I made it through um, and survived. But I say that because yesterday when I watched the news, there are still children who do not have their parents in this very city. And speaking as one who used, who one, <clears throat> the day it happened, I, my mom picked me up from school every day. I'm watching the clock. I know I got three minutes, so um, I'm sorry. Um, she picked me up every day and then one day she wasn't there and that was it. My life has changed forever. So I could just imagine, you know, I feel fortunate enough that I have a master's degree and I'm privileged. I'm a veteran. I have, uh, you know, income. I don't need to work. My life is great. <clears throat> However, I live with a burden and I can never be satisfied because there are still children who suffer how I did. So my recommendations to you all is to increase the collaboration, the, the recruitment and the outreach. Go out to these communities. These people are out there. You know, I live in East Harlem. I don't 
you know, live in Long Island and go to the hood to work. Go to these communities, find these people, serve these people, maintain retention, because a lot of programs only have a 60 to 70% success rate. So we need to begin to see why, why. We also need pathways to careers. I know that DYCD does a great job with the summer youth employment and I applaud you for that. However, that's just the summer. So we need something that could build a career pathway. And I understand we have success stories. You know, I am a success story but I want all of my people to be success and all of the people that are, you know, living under these conditions. <clears throat> Lastly, two things, uh, healing and violence prevention. Healing is a very important thing. And I've actually realized that myself because though I have all these accolades, I never, I never faced my trauma. So COVID really affected me because when I lost my job, all I did was sit at home and, you know, the trauma really uh, gave me a breakdown. So I was fortunate to get services and, you know, I'm better now. So I could just imagine what a young person goes through. Lastly, violence prevention. I think we need to increase that. Um, I know that the Department of Education, I mean, Department of Probation does uh Arches program with violence, violence protection, violence prevention, and the Department of uh, Mental Health has the violence interrupters. But I think we need to increase it because uh, we see shootings uh, every day. We're seeing 14-year-old kids. I think the other day there was an eight-year-old kid with a pistol who walked into a school. Um, so although we paint this very beautiful thing. Um, inside of it, it's, it's disgusting. And I think we need to really um, improve that. So um, I'm not trying to bash, I'm, I'm just speaking of the reality. And I just hope we all put our you know, brains together to uh, change. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, again, for always coming, always sharing your story, always giving passion, never forgetting where you come from, and also, thank you for remembering, Luis. It's been a major loss. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next, Arena Jose. You know that? Hey, up there. I believe Ariana Jose. She's oh, unable yeah, to sorry. join us. I, yeah, she's unable to join us today, so we can move on to the next. Sure. Edward Sanchez. Some of these we may have to go back to, right? Yeah, I think Edward is logging on right now, so we can come back to him. He just texted me. Great. Thank you. We can we can do Amber Amber Parsons. She just put her name in the chat, and I see her on the screen. Okay, Amber Parson from the Flatbush Beacon Center. Welcome. It's always great to hear from the Flatbush Beacon. I know they come to the last several um, hearings. Okay. Wait, hold on. Okay, give me a minute. Let me share my screen. If I can. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Okay, hold on. Hello, my name is Amber Parsons, and I'm from the Flatbush Beacon Center Youth Council. I attend Parkside Preparatory Academy, and I'm in the seventh grade. The issue I would like to talk about is quality school meal. I'll be talking about this topic because when I saw quality school meal, I knew I had to pick it and stand up for us students because I'm speaking on the behalf of all NYC schools. To get more in depth about this topic, the school lunch is not good quality. I feel like even though Parkside Preparatory Academy is a public school, and we, we are not in the best neighborhood, we should be able to eat right. Since, since I claim that we, hold on. Since I claim that we don't get good food, let me share the foods that we get so you could get an idea. We get cheese sticks, dry unseasoned chicken, watery spinach, and hard biscuits. Some, some of you may be thinking, why should I care about what you eat? You should care because we get these same foods every day, back to back, and that's leaving many of us kids unsatisfied. Some kids only get to eat at school because they may have some problems at home. 
they should at least be able to get one one meal for the day at school. Get a good school quality meal. Think about it. If us kids get served nasty food, most of us are going to throw it away. And that is a waste of food, which is another social problem. Plus, in most school cafeterias, we have a food a school food plate, which contains fruits, vegetables, dairy, grain, meat, and we do not always get this on our plate, which is an issue. Hopefully I can make a change in the school meals for my speech, or at least make more people realize what's going on with the school meals and stand up to the issue. That's it. Thank you, Amber. You're welcome. Thank you, Amber. I will take back like the information you just share with our Office of School Health and we'll be able to respond to your inquiry and definitely agree that um, it is a different issue also not just what you're putting in, but also the waste that's happening um, if students are not eating their food. Thank you. Amber. Yes. School lunch, school lunch sucks. It, it always mm -hmm. sucks. Yeah. And the Department of Health has recently uh, uh, started like an initiative. They have commercials for like healthy eating. But um, I think I agree with you that um, it's not teaching you what to eat. It's giving you the food because uh, you're in a community where you probably can't afford that. Thank you. Thank you. No Next up, Ryan Rodman from Youth Action. Hi. Hi, my name is Ryan Ronman and I'm a junior at Eleanor Roosevelt High School. I am here to talk about educational equity in New York City because I've witnessed the changes in our public school system and seen its impacts firsthand. Last year, all students experienced profound isolation and learning loss as the pandemic prevented students from being in classrooms. According to data from the New York City Department of Education, only 85% of students had interactions with remote learning during the spring 2020 term, and rates of interactions were lowest in districts with high economic insecurity and among students in temporary housing. This issue disproportionately impacts Black and Latinx youth, further exacerbating racial inequities in education that predated the pandemic, which can be seen in historical disparities between white students and their Black and Latinx counterparts in test scores, graduation rates, and college readiness. More than half of the 1,300 youth who responded to the Vo Voicing Our Future Youth Survey reported they did not receive extracurricular support, such as tutoring, college, internship, or job opportunities in the last year. Youth who completed the survey also indicated that educational support ranks first on the list of important resources for youth in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so Ryan had a co-presenter, um, Eugenia. Can she present with her? Yeah. Yes. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Eugenia Bomfo, and I'm a junior at the Marble Hill School for International Studies. I'm here to talk to you about educational equity because as a student at a Title I school in the Bronx, I've seen the consequences of, edu of educational inequity firsthand. In addition, in addition to what Ryan talked about, I would like to point out that New York City has the most segregated school system in the country, which continuously excludes Black and Latinx students from admittance into the city's highest performing schools. This is explicitly racist and needs to be remedied. And we know that desegregated schools are not just good for students of color, but for white students as well. In order to address educational inequity, New York City must First, ensure each school receives proper funding to offer students tests and college preparation and an array of extracurriculars as well as ad adequate materials and resources for each classroom. Second, ensure the universal mosaic curriculum is implemented in all schools and that schools have the resources they need for successful integration of content into the curriculum. Third, integrate New York City schools by reimagining re admissions policies to ensure that Black, Latinx, and low-income students are not shut out of the city's most competitive and desirable schools. Lastly, eliminate the gifted and talented program and replace it with school-wide enrichment models. Thank you for the opportunity.
Thank you. I see Laura has her hand raised. I don't know if she has someone else. No, nope, I was just clapping. That was the clapping oh. emoji. <laughs> okay. Carolyn Joy. Yeah, hi. Um, hello, my name is Carolyn G. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm currently a freshman at Princeton University. I come to you today from my college dorm. <laughs> um, I'm presenting today. I'm present here today to testify for increased funding for experiential based youth internships. So I kind of just want to tell a little story to illustrate my point. When I applied to intern for the Manhattan Borough President's Office, I pictured myself crouching over filing cabinets to organize archives. Instead, on my first day, I was handed a packet of papers labeled ramp survey and instructed to download a protractor app that would aid me in measuring the angle of street ramps. With that, I headed to Murray Hill where my first assignment would begin. At the corner of 34th and Lexington, I kneeled on the coffee stained concrete and began measuring the length and angle of the street ramp. Though a girl squatting on bustling streets for hours in three inch heels was probably not the most common sight, knowing that my work would be used in policy to ensure that people with disabilities could easily cross the city sidewalks motivated me to look past the confused stares of passersby. Measuring the, streets of, measuring the street ramps of Murray Hill was just one of the many adventures I experienced that summer. From surveying the condition of NYCHA playgrounds to disseminating flyers containing important housing resources, I realized that public service is not merely found within the bounds of an office. It's found in town halls bursting with passionate discourse about land use and local libraries bursting with the laughter of excited children. Essentially, the Big Apple with all its hidden nooks and crannies became my office. In doing so, it offered me to glimpse into the million different worlds I'd otherwise never been exposed to and a million different worlds that have since fueled my excitement for public service. My experience interning for the Manhattan Borough President's Office is a testament to the power of youth experiential based internships in shaping a young person's identity and intellectual endeavors. With the power to influence and engage in community service services, young people are equipped with the resources necessary to affect tangible changes in local communities and provide resources to those in need. Thus, it is pertinent that the government funnels more resources towards creating dynamic experiential based opportunities for youth to engage in, which given the city's $90 million budget is extremely feasible and extremely needed, especially in these times. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. I actually got my start in city government at an internship as well and began this career. Um, well, you know, that's why we were very proud that we work with our elected officials. I think the majority of council members actually had SYP interns this past summer. A lot of elected officials, community boards, and yes, the, the Manhattan Borough President's Office has been a terrific, terrific supporter of that effort. And I really appreciate what you had to say. So thank you. Next up, I'm gonna call Ann Wright. Hi, I'm sorry, my co-presenter -pres co isn't here, but um, can you come back to me? Sure, just remind me in case I forget. Terry Chowdhury, we uh, from the um, New York City Ambassador Program. And if I screw up your name, I apologize. Sierra Chowdhury. Um, Sierra was having some trouble getting home from school today, yep. so I think she may be a few minutes late. Um, but okay. I'll let you know when she gets back on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sumita so Lacy, Youth Action. I believe Sumita and then the rest that follow her are coming on at four. So if we wanted to, we can start with the um, folks from the Flatbush that have identified themselves in the chat sure. box. Sure. So Tom, where do they? Where do we start? I'm just. We, let's actually start with um, Edward Sanchez from Youth Action. He was supposed to go a little bit earlier, but and then we'll do Flatbush. All right. Thanks, Tom. Hi, my name is Edward Sanchez. I apologize for my lateness. Uh, MTA delays, you know how it is. Um, so first of all, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As I said, my name is Edward Sanchez. I am a freshman currently enrolled and attending Baruch College, and I'm here to talk about school policing. Uh, police presence in schools inhibit a safe learning space and create an environment where students may feel criminalized. Uh, New York City has more school safety agents in schools than any other school district in the country spending $450 million to police uh, students. Replacing punitive measures and dis disciplinary practices with restorative and supportive learning 
will help dismantle the school to uh, school to prison pipeline and promote a safer environment. In an NYCLU survey of 1,000 high school students at schools with metal detectors, 53% reported that officers have spoken with them in a way that made them feel uncomfortable. In addition, 58% reported that 58% reported that they would have ta- they would have taken off and or lifted up clothing to enter school, and 82% of students surveyed reported that they have been late to class because of the metal detectors. Personally, for me, I attend Fort Hamilton High School. Same same situation. I was late 10 minutes. It was ridiculous. In June of 2021, the Healing Centered Schools Task Force developed recommendations to preserve trauma, increase academic engagement, and improve social emotional well-being of students. According to the task force, punitive measures and biased curriculums should be replaced with trauma-responsive classroom practices, restorative and supportive responses to behavior, and a culturally responsive curriculum. Interestingly, in the Voicing Our Future survey of over 1,300 NYC youth, 45% of youth said they feel safer with police in schools. When unpacking this finding in in focus groups with youth, we found that many youth have relationships with their school safety agents that are more reflective of a mentor or social worker than a police officer. Many said officers in their schools were more relatable than teachers and sometimes seem to care more. However, police officers aren't trained in this field, meaning that replacing officers with guidance counselors and social workers would benefit youth by providing them with much needed uh, social emotional health support. Regardless of the fact that many students have positive relationships with their school safety officers, there are many students for whom policing in schools have a detrimental effect, especially black and brown students. Black and Latinx students are disproportionately impacted by over policing in schools, making up 91% of students who are arrested who are arrested or receive a summons in school. Student contact with police increased the likelihood of suspension, making them twice as likely to twice as likely to drop out and also puts them at a higher risk of entering the juvenile justice system, which no one wants that. In order to address racial disparities with respect to policing in schools for youth, New York City must take action to the following recommendations. Reduce the size and scope and presence of the school safety agents in schools with the ultimate phasing out of the uh, school safety agents entirely. Change the control of the school security office from the NYPD to the Department of Education, returning that power back to the DOE. Redirect funds from school policing to implement healing-centered and restorative and trauma-responsive practices in place of punitive measures. Eliminate zero tolerance and and other overly harsh school discipline policies. And lastly, eliminate metal detectors and wand sweeps from school entry procedures. (coughs) Thank you very much. Thank you, Edward. Next up, we'll call upon Shayla Bowen. Bowen. And Shayla. Yes, I'm here. Welcome. Hi. Can I go? Okay. Hello, my name is Shayla Bowen, and I'm from the Flappish Beacon Center Youth Council. I attend Parkside Preparatory Academy, and I'm in the eighth grade. The issue I'd like to talk about is school lunch. Here are some issues I have observed myself with the school lunch. During lunchtime, the food is often uncooked or overcooked, like dry chicken with a little bit of sauce. The biscuits are very hard to chew. Dry burgers with only one ketchup packet, plus no juice or water offered by the cafeteria, just milk. Does anyone on this panel drink milk when going out to eat lunch or dinner? I'm part of a co-located school. Their middle schoolers don't even come upstairs, don't even don't even go to the cafeteria. Instead, they get their lunch bagged and brought upstairs. The food is often come out raw or overcooked like ours. Remember the milk I was talking about? The milk is often spoiled and the choices of white or chocolate milk are uneven. The breakfast can often be cold and bland. Like one morning, we had waffles and the waffles were frozen. The menu is not what's being served. For an example, the burger deluxe. What is a burger deluxe to you? Well, our burger deluxe looks raw, can sometimes be dry and uncooked, and just between bread. That's it. That's our, that's our deluxe. Maybe with a little bit of ketchup on the side, but that's it. 
The impact that it has on our schools is that we sometimes don't eat the food that is being served to us. That can make us tired and have no energy, which stops us from learning and focusing in class. That can cause us to fail class and get bad grades. This is why students should have more voice in creating the menu and why you should provide more money and care for the school lunch. And this is my statement on school lunch. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate you sharing your experience. I believe we have more people from the Flatbush Beacon Center. Um, yeah. Tom, why don't you... Um... Go yeah, down the can. list that you have. Yeah, Alyssa Maloney is next from Flatbush. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Alyssa Maloney, and I am part of Flatbush Beacon Center Youth Council. I attend Parks at Preparatory Academy, and I am in the sixth grade. The issue I like to talk about is the crossing guards. The crossing guards don't do the job at all. All they do is stand on the street and linger talk on their phones, and talk to their friends. My school crossing guard are, are barely there, and that is not safe for everyone because there are a lot of crazy people that may be drunk or on drugs, and they can run you over. Also, without crossing guards, some drivers ignore pedestrians while they cross the street, which is very common. One of the members of the, youth, of, the, of the council was crossing the street and almost got run over because the crossing guards were not paying attention and were this just on the phone and did not even notice the fact that one of the members almost got run over. If crossing guards are not doing the job properly, people may get hurt. Thank you for listening to the issue that I want to talk about. Thank you for sharing your experiences. What school was this at? Parkside. Parkside. We can certainly flag that. So thank you. Next, we have uh, Danae O'Brien, also from Flatbush. Danea on. Danea, we can't hear you. We can move to uh, Chelsea Jin from Flatbush if she's here. She, they're, they're here. It's just there. I think she's having trouble with her mic. I'm gonna let her use mine. Oh, okay. No worries. Thank you. Just give a uh, ten seconds. Okay, sorry for the interruptions. No worries. Oh. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Danae Bryan, and I'm from the Flatbush Beacon Center Youth Council. I go to Park Preparatory Academy, and I'm in the eighth grade. The topic I'll be talking about today is mental health. Mental health affects many NYC students alike in the DOE school system. Bullying, drug use, cyberbullying, homophobia, sexism, et cetera are all things that affect teens' mental health, especially due to the pandemic. To combat all these things, there needs to be an increase in school counselors. Due to the lack of school counselors, for example, one school counselor for around 400 to 500 students, this is both mentally draining to the counselor and the other students since they're not officially under the counselor, even though they would still have to have the ability to talk to the counselor for any mental help needed. What we could do is assign more school counselors 
to NYC DOE schools. In order to maintain good mental health among students and to release the workload for school counselors. We have made several complaints from before, but we now need to be heard. It is 2021, about to be 2022. And the mental issues for children have increased and the amount of school counselors to combat this problem have not increased. Increasing number of school counselors in schools, not the social workers, help with matriculation because the availability of school counselors helping students with college access transitioning is limited. This is what Danae O'Brien of the Flatbush Beacon Center Youth Council has to say about the topic of mental health and issues. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, is there anyone else on, on the chat box? Yeah, Chelsea, also with Flatbush Beacon. Good afternoon. My name is Chelsea Jean, and I am one of the youth council members who will be representing Flatbush Beacon Center. I attend Parkside Preparatory Academy, also known as MS2, and I am in grade seven. The issues I would like to talk about today is street safety. A significant issue that goes around some neighborhoods is street because usually in the lights in some neighborhoods, they usually go off or they're not on, such as the neighborhood that we that we're in right now. We need to put more lights because as the night grow dar darker, children are more likely to become kidnapped, which has become a major issue in many neighborhoods. Also, we need to see where we're going so that we don't end up getting lost. Predators following the streets at night, kidnappers and drug dealers are just a few of the reasons why the street lights can be extremely dangerous at night. Please accept my sincere. Thanks for taking the time to hear what I had to say about street safety. It has been an honor to meet you all, and I hope y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Just a quick question for you. Is it that we need more street lights in that area, or do you think it's lack of maintenance of the current street lights? May you repeat that, please? Is it, is it that we need more street lights, or we have to maintain the street lights that are there already? You have to maintain the street lights. Can I like? Can I suggest like? Have, I don't know if we called three one one for that, or your local elected official to help with that. Okay. You could certainly take it back as well. What's what is the location? Around Parkside Avenue. Do you know the intersection? Nostrand and Rogers Avenue. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Emily Velez from Parkside Preparatory Academy. Is Emily on the phone? Yeah, she, just give her a second. Okay, thank getting, you very much. Getting, I, I really appreciate bringing all these young people here. Can, can we come back to Emily? She's going to get herself right. And yeah, she's having little technical difficulties. Okay. Can do. Tom, are the other testifiers on? Do you know? Yes, yeah, so that's it from the chat box. We can go um, back to Anne Wright from Youth Action if she's ready. Yes, hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Anna Wright, and I'm a sophomore at the United Nations International School. I'm here to talk to you today about youth mental health because prioritizing policies that promote child, healthy childhood development and behavioral health is crucial to addressing the mental health crisis. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth 15 to 19 and the third leading, leading cause of death for children five to, nine, five to 14, sorry. Anxiety and depression increasingly impact more and more of our city's youth due to, due to factors such as social media, climate change and the effects of the coronavirus pandemic. Job insecurity and poor mental health among parents, social isolation and heightened abuse are all contributing factors brought on by COVID. Due to efforts to limit the spread of COVID-19, mental health care providers operated on limited capacity during the pandemic, 
And while use of telehealth did increase, the increase hasn't been enough to compensate for the drop of in-person care. From February to October 2020, the number of New York children rece receiving mental health care services through Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program dropped a shocking 50%. Prior to the pandemic, 3.7 million adolescents received mental health services through their schools, and one youth re went remote and lost access. Finally, mental, many hospitals decreased the number of youth psychiatric beds available in emergencies in order to compensate for the influx of COVID patients. In the Voicing Our Future Youth Survey, it was reported that the second most important resource to NYC youth following educational support was mental health support. The survey also found that 35% of New York City's youth wanted or needed mental health services during the pandemic. Of that 35%, only 42% were able to access these essential services. Now my co-presenter co will share. Good afternoon. Thank you for the, this opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Samita Lacey. I'm a senior at the United Nations International School, and I'm also here to talk to you about youth mental health. Um, prior to the pandemic, one in four students across the nation were suffering from some sort of trauma, whether it be a result of abuse, racism, poverty, or, or some other life circumstance. Uh, schools that do not have the resources or counselors with training to assist children in working through these traumas can make situations worse and leave countless children suffering unnecessarily. Um, and with the lives of students being completely altered by the pandemic in terms of financial stability, ability to socialize, and the loss of family members, counseling is more important and essential than ever before. Um, in order to address the youth mental health crisis, New York City needs to take action. Uh, one, it could increase investments in community-based behavioral health supports for adolescents that are culturally responsive, um, accessible, and widely known. Uh, number two, it could substantially increase investments in a full continuum of behavioral health supports for students K for students K to 12 schools, including whole school approaches that are healing centered and trauma informed. Uh, increase the number of qualified counselors and school work and social workers in schools to reach the recommended 250 to one counselor student ratio. Strengthen and build relationships between schools and community based behavioral health providers ensure that students who have been designated as having higher level needs have access to clinical services outside of school. And finally, engage with communities to determine which services are most needed in each community and school. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Tom, I know we had a group of students that weren't available. I don't know if they're now available. Yeah, did we wanna go back to Emily Velez? Sure. I think Emily is ready. Are you guys ready for Emily? Yeah. Yes. Just do it from my computer. Come, come, come. Sorry, she's gonna make her way to my computer so she can speak because the other one didn't work either. Okay. Good afternoon, my name is Emily Belize. I am a part of the Flatbush Beacon Youth Council. I attend Park State Preparatory Academy. I am in seventh grade and the issue I would like to bring is street safety. Street safety is an important part of our community because it is up for our safety and are for our kids and adults. First problem I am bringing is how there's not there are many crossing guards in this area and other areas where it's K to 12. And 
and the other schools need it because there are accidents that happen in this area and they can still happen to young kids and older kids as well. Street guards should get a break, but I'm also saying that they should help kids with issues because most kids don't know how to cross the street alone and they can barely walk home alone without feeling scared something bad can happen to them. Walking home alone makes kids feel anxious and also having them feel scared. Many kids get taken away per year because of them walking alone and maybe sometimes walking in groups. Kids and and maybe even some adults feel scared to walk home at night, especially in winter, because that is when it gets dark quickly. But with crossing guards, it makes them feel better and safer because teenagers and kids like knowing the fact that they are safe and knowing nothing bad is going to happen to them. Thank you, Emily, for sharing that. Now, we heard a couple of folks talk about safety in that area, including lighting and school um, crossing guards, and we'll certainly we'll take that back. So thank you, Emily. Tom, do we know if young people from the Civil Liberties Union are available? Yeah, yeah we can start with um, Jason from the New York Civil Liberties Union. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Jason and I'm currently a sophomore at New York High School. I'm here to speak on the importance of immigrant rights as a member of the New York Civil Liberties Union's teen activist project. With the assumption of any newly elected officials use the ability to precipitate change, for liberty and equality, as some persons suppose, are chiefly to be found in a democracy, it must be so by every department of government being alike open to all, but as, but as the People are in the majority and what they vote is law. It allows, it follows as such a state of democracy. On January 20th, 2021, Joseph R. Biden was sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. His proposal for preserving our merit as a nation of immigrants includes modernizing America's immigration system and welcoming immigrants into our community. However, the imminent threat of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also, also known as ICE, is still promoting unrest within New York where seven 125,000 undocumented immigrants currently reside. Currently, there is a federal effort to redirect ICE to focus on an individual rather than groups of specific offenses. However, this would allow ICE agents broad discretion to determine if one poses a threat to public safety and national security. Thus, how are we able to warrant that the onus is on ICE agents to satisfy this instance? We cannot but continue to oppose these inadequate propositions and strive for something greater. Without this effort, the continuation of the indifferent separation of families in America is inevitable. I come from a family of immigrants whose sole aspiration was the anticipation for better days, though they were met with an entity of pride and, equi and e inequity. Yet this experience is not merely mine, but the, one, but the ones of millions throughout America. Hence, I am urging every one of you to amplify the concerns within our community and to champion any proposal that protects immigrant New Yorkers and keeps them safe in New York City. Thank you, Jason. Nicole Matter? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Welcome. Good afternoon. So do I start? Yes, please. All right. Hi, my name is Nicole, and I'm a member of New York Civil Liberties Union Team Activist Project. And I'm here to talk about the role of the, the NYPD plays in my community. In my community, it has come to my attention that there is an unfortunate disconnect between both residents of Port Richmond and local police that surveil the area. There is not much of an effort put in by 121's precinct to effectively communicate with residents or build trust with us. I walk through my community feeling hopeless. My body tenses up when I see a police officer walk by me, making me feel like, every, like my every move is being watched and monitored in, anticip in anticipation of my failure. This lack of effort leads me to believe the city has completely given up on majority and minority communities with no real change implemented to improve our relationships with law enforcement. The NYPD, specifically the 121 precinct, which, which serves the poor Richmond community, among others, can work on improving my community and repairing the broken relationship between local police and residents of my neighborhood by demonstrating to us that behind the uniforms, most officers are also residents of our own communities. Maybe if the precinct were to host virtual events with community members for us to express general concerns or even just to, to know the officers who serve our community. 
A vast majority of the cause for the disconnect is the language barrier. Most officers in the 121's precinct do not understand or speak Spanish, leaving my non-English speaking neighbors to feel scared for their lives when it comes to anything that has to do with law enforcement, which in turn gives me a sense of responsibility as a bilingual woman to be extra vigilant in case anyone needs any assistance. As a young person, this should not fall into my shoulders. To bear this responsibility, but I do it because I care for my community. Police officers have made myself and other members of my community feel unsafe. I'm here today to ask that there is, not, that is, there is more of an effort made by NYPD to build trust with the communities and to meet us where we're at, not only physically, but also when it comes to the languages we speak as well. We are a diverse community and must, and must have all of our needs met. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for sharing that. And as you know, um, the, the NYPD is listening. So I, I know that they will bring back your concerns. Can I just add something real quick, Andrew? Sure. Hi. Um, so this is for both Nicole and Jason. So the office that I work for, which is the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence, operates the family justice centers as well. And while this doesn't address all the issues that you brought up, I do want the two of you to know that help is available for people who are undocumented or who do not speak English, if they're looking for services as they relate to like intimate partner violence, domestic violence, stalking, trafficking, sexual assault, and elder abuse. And at the Family Justice Centers, even people who are undocumented, so long as they're residents of New York City can still access those services, whether it's meeting with someone to create a safety plan um, or receiving some sort of like legal assistance. Um, and they do have translation services as well at these centers. So if English isn't someone's primary language, they can still access a lot of these resources. Thank you, that helps a lot. I'll try to get that out in my community. What's called again? The Family Justice Centers. Okay, thank you. I will definitely be telling my neighbors about this. Thank you, Gabriel, for offering that great resource. Next up, Jonathan Lamb. Okay, hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, good Andy. afternoon, Council. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lamb. I'm 16 years old, and I'm currently a junior at Benjamin M. Cardoza High School. I'm involved with organizing alongside the New York Civil Liberties Union's Teen Activist Project. Today, I will be speaking about the need to expand protection for all undocumented immigrants living in New York City and New York State. Many undocumented immigrants are living in fear every single day. As a son of Vietnamese refugees, I've learned through my parents' stories the hardships and struggles that undocumented families and immigrants face every single day. Both of my parents never got the chance to attend college and started to work at a young age in order to support their families. They struggled to access housing and relied heavily on food stamps. Throughout this pandemic, undocumented families have been left behind. I watched my community, Jackson Heights, struggle as our businesses were forced to close down. We watched our, our rent increase and our families struggle to pay the bills. Our family and community members were getting sick and we watched policing increase in our community. Jackson Heights, along with other immigrant communities, struggled to receive assistance and support for their own communities. We have been left behind and we were left to fight for ourselves. With my personal experience with community organizing around immigrant rights, I've heard stories from my community members facing all types of issues, from housing to harassment, from landlords to food insecurity. And the most common fear was deportation and ICE involvement in their communities. I've heard stories of sacrifice and years of trying to get by living in the United States. No family should be struggling and living in fear constantly, regardless of their immigration status. We should be creating a welcoming city that accepts, protects, and helps provide a stable environment for all immigrants and for their kids to thrive in. For too long, our government has cared more about overfunding ICE instead of addressing the real issues that we've been facing. The YCLU has been advocating for the passage of the New York for All Act at the state legislation which would prohibit state and local officers from enforcing federal immigration laws, feeling people into ICE custody and sharing sensitive information with ICE, among other things. This type of bill is so important to protect the undocumented community. Overall, our undocumented community members should be recognized for their rights and well-being. We need to ensure the safety of undocumented youth in the city as well and their families. We need to promote a city that protects undocumented communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jonathan. 
Next up, Olivia Tan. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, hi. Um, I did not like memorize my um, testament. So just putting that out there. Um, hi, my name is Olivia Tan uh, and I'm a senior at John Mountain High School and an organizer at the NYCLU, uh, New York Civil Liberties Union uh, Teen Activist Project. Today, uh, I'll be talking about the severe lack of emotional support provided to students by the New York Civil, sorry, New York City Department of Education. Uh, there are many cases where the only place students can receive mental health is in school. This is mainly due to the fact that uh, students may not receive the necessary mental health resources at home, whether that be because their guardians are not willing to accept that the student has mental health issues, the student is not comfortable disclosing the fact that they have mental health issues to the guardian, etc. Um, unfortunately, in school, the mental health services provided to students are not as accessible to them as they would hope. Guidance counselors and teachers alike are overworked and unable to provide each of their students with ample support, whether ac academically or mentally. Though their attempts to supporting students are appreciated, it falls short of what each student truly needs. According to the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, more than one in three high school students had experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness in 2019, a 40% increase since 2009. In, two in 2019, approximately one in six youth reported making a suicide plan in the past year, a 44% increase since 2009. Why has it become commonplace for students to feel hopeless and experience so much pain that they plan to die before they can even learn how to drive? Depression shouldn't be another cliche high school experience like prom that almost every student should go through. I didn't think I was going to make it past 13. Do you know what that does to a child? The, pl the pain they would have to feel as a result of school to want to die before they could even reach high school. Some of my closest friends that they that thought that they would have died before entering high school. Even two of my best friends tried committing suicide. They were unsex uh, unsuccessful, thankfully, but all of this could have been prevented if the New York public school system implemented and funded adequate mental health services for schools and hired trained pro medical professionals to help students navigate their lives. I'm not saying that once they do so, everything will immediately get better. No, it won't, but things will begin to improve. I'll call me back. Um, I am here asking you today to think of the students that are suffering in, in school that are unable to receive the support they require and do everything you can to ensure that New York City meets a rec recommended ratio of guidance counselors and social workers to students so that we can get adequate support in, we need in schools. Don't let our generation become another number, another Hello? statistic, Wait, another body that is boss. Hello. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Hello. this so, is crazy because... Um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, please continue. Okay. Uh, don't let our generation become another number, another statistic, another body that is tossed to the side and ignored, uh, another person that could have been saved. Please prioritize the mental health of your students. We are under your care. Please don't fall short simply because economics and reputation matter more than real living children that need help, that need your help. Thank you all for listening to me with an open mind, and I hope you take my words into consideration. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Thank you, Olivia. Andrew, uh, if I may chime in, um, we did see the U.S. Surgeon General's report on uh, the state of young people and the onset of depression. And uh, we will be, in fact, uh, featuring that topic at our quarterly membership early in the new year. Uh, so please look out for that. We are going to certainly uh, bring in uh, experts in the field and try to identify resources that can help and address that issue. So thank you so much for sharing that point of view. Thanks, Eduardo. Uh, Jenny Vernette from the Flatbush Beacon Center. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, hello. I am Jenny Vernette and I am from Flatbush Beacon Center's Youth Council. I attend Parkside Preparatory Academy and I'm in the seventh grade. The issue I'd like to talk about is construction. For example, in my school, we have construction going across, on across the street. It's very unpleasant to hear a lot of noise while trying to learn. Also, the smell of the dust in the construction is disgusting. Some kids with serious asthma can't breathe properly when near construction. 
we have already called 311 and they have not done anything. But as a student, I came up with a solution. The construction can happen after school hours. I think this is a good idea because since no kids are in the area at the time, the workers don't have to worry about the kids' safety and the kids can have and enjoy their school time learning. It's a good solution for everyone. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Jenny, for that, your creativity and coming up with the solution to make sure that your studies aren't interrupted by construction. Tom, did we miss anyone? Is there anyone that we didn't call upon? I believe Samantha Rodriguez um, with the Teen Activist Project is figuring out Wi-Fi. Is that correct, Kenny? Is she, is she ready? I don't see her on yet, so I think she's still figuring it out. Um, I'll let you know if she's able to get on. Thanks. Well, I believe she is the last person, so. Is there anyone else present that would like to testify that has not testified? There's Deanna. a name, Deanna, yeah. Cool. Deanna Pollan from the Flatbush Beacon Center. She's having a little mic trouble over there. Push the cord. Big shout out to Flatbush Beacon Center. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hudson. No problem. You want to use my computer? Can you speak so we can hear? I'll let her use my computer. Come on over here. Hello, my name is Deanna Pullen and I am a member of the Flatbush Beacon Youth Council. I am in seventh grade at Parkside Preparatory Academy. The topic I would like to discuss is the quality of meals served. The majority of meals served in schools are not prepared from scratch and do not include fresh fruits or vegetables. Schools are serving us raw or un undercooked food as well as food that has gone bad. Also, the food is either frozen or prepared elsewhere and then heated before being served. This dish has been prepared in a stale and unappealing manner, which is unfortunate. In addition, I believe schools have been serving us a small amount of food. I understand that everyone needs to eat, but I believe that we should all be able to get enough food to keep our brains fed and allow us to concentrate on our work for the duration of the day. I also believe that our meals should be prepared with greater care. To be honest, if the school lunches aren't good, we'll just throw them out. This is an unnecessary waste of food. I hope you take this matter into consideration and take me for, the, for your time. Thank you. We have Mary Ann Egentola from DYCD's We the Youth Advisory Council. Welcome. Hi everyone, my name is Miriam and I'm with DYCS with the Youth Council. I'm here today to talk about the youth agenda. Um, as youth, we're not given a seat at the table despite being a part of the community. So we're constantly ignored and our needs and wants are not prioritized as much. These are the reasons why the youth agenda matters. The youth agenda matters as um, prioritizes issues in New York City and shows how changes can be made to these issues. For example, systemic racism, learning, we have this, we prioritize these issues and we have recommendations as to how NYC can fix these issues for youth. As a youth advisor, I help develop questions and also I moderate conversations amongst youth and experts to help um, bring solutions to these issues. Um, the youth agenda prioritizes youth needs through recommendations that do cater to these issues. We hope you consider this um, the youth agenda because it matters because all youth matters and we deserve access to resources that can help us succeed. I will drop the link to the youth agenda so you can all endorse it and take it into recommendations as you reform New York City for youth. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for all your efforts, particularly uh, throughout the pandemic. 
Is there anyone else that we that registered or cares to testify? If so, either put your name in the chat or raise your hand. <coughs> Anyone else? Eduardo, I guess we should then wrap things up and then keep the hearing open as it's as we advertise this till five o'clock. That's right, Andrew. Uh, we will continue the dialogue. Uh, we appreciate all the member agencies and all the government partners that have joined us. Uh, we will certainly uh, share this testimony that we received today, uh, the recording, the transcript in the coming weeks, and it'll also be posted on the Department of Youth and Community Development website. Uh, the feedback that we receive is very important to us. We certainly reflect it. As I already mentioned, we will be uh, highlighting the topic uh, of the Surgeon General's report in terms of uh, depression in young people at an uh, upcoming meeting. Uh, we've heard a lot of feedback as it relates to uh, diet, uh, transportation, et cetera. And we certainly will convey uh, the information received to our partners. Uh, so yes, we will continue the hearing. Um, uh, and anticipate that some additional people may join us, but for purposes of the panel, we will record whatever is said and share that with them at this point in time. And again, I want to thank the city agencies for coming, but particularly I want to thank the providers and our young people for really showing up and making their voices be heard. I mean, here's an opportunity to speak to 20 different city agencies. I've heard today a lot about safety issues around schools. We heard about school lunch. We heard about school the needs for school counselors. We heard about police relationships, um, the need for more mental health services, the need for pathways to colleges and uh, year round um, workforce development programs. And we really appreciate that feedback. And in order, I know Andrew, Andrew, there is actually another individual, Mohammed, uh, would like to say a few words. So, Mohammed, uh, we do have you, we do see you. Uh, please join us. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Mohamed Oguntola, I'm with the DYCD Youth Advisory Council. And I just wanted to share a few words about an issue that I feel that is, needs, needs to be addressed uh, within, within the city. Uh, the, this issue is, is, is one that pertains to my uh, identity as a Muslim. As a, as a Muslim, uh, there, there, are several, there are multiple celebrations. There's one, there's a celebration that, after, after the holy month of Ramadan, there is an Eid celebration, but doing for, for that celebration, schools are, are, are usually kept open, so uh, students are forced to, to choose to either go to school or to uh, and, and leave the and leave this celebration or to uh, go or to miss classes and to miss this the school. Work. So I think this is an issue that needs to be addressed as, um, as, as a religious, as a religious uh, celebration, as, as a religious matter. And uh, yeah, we're looking at uh, many other celebrations like Anuka, like Christmas, they are giving consideration. So it's a, a, a bit unfair that uh, Islamic celebration is excluded. So I think that's something that we should give a priori priority to in, in trying to make a better, City for the youth. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Much, much appreciated. Eduardo, Tom, do we have anyone else? We have uh, Sam Rodriguez from the oh. New York Civil Liberties Union. She's back on now. Oh, welcome. Hello, sorry. Uh, I was having internet troubles. No worries. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, so, hello, my name is Sam, and I am a senior at Curry's High School and an organizer at the New York Civil Liberties Union um, Teen Activist Project. As a member of NYCLU's Teen Activist Project, I'm here to speak about the ongoing issue of the schools to prison pipeline. 
um, as education teaches individuals to think, feel, and act in ways that contribute to their success and benefit not only themselves, but also their community. Furthermore, education promotes the development of human personality, intelligence, and interpersonal relationships, as well as preparing individuals for life events. While this purpose of schools sounds beneficial to students, students of color and students with disabilities and LGBTQI students are still being penalized in an unreasonable manner, mainly with school suspensions. This punishment fails to resolve the issue and this environment which encourage educate, educating kids to behave positively when dealing with people in life contradicts the alleged benefits school is supposed to supply students. When school safety officers target students, specifically BIPOC, LGBTQI, and students with disabilities, instead of protecting them from the possible dangers that may occur to them, they're the dangers in the officer's eyes and these types of students constantly carry targets on their backs while struggling to receive fair education. An outburst of emotion in class could lead to students falling behind in their education. And once you're behind, it's a challenge to get back on track. I've been in instances where I was penalized harsher than a non-POC student. And I've witnessed similar scenarios happen to other students as well. School has become a hazardous environment for children like myself. And I believe that suspensions destroy the trust and relationship that exists between the students and the school. Relationships that are essential for child's, for child's success. Suspension sends the message to these students that they are unwelcome and that, um, that they're unwelcome and that they're the source of the problem and that they must be removed. I wish I could look at my school as a positive facility to expand my education, but knowing that I could be suspended simply because an authority figure at my school feels as though I should be punished due to an outburst that would mess everything I built up over the years. If we actually took the time to troubleshoot and figure out why the problem occurred in the first place, students would learn how to feel, how to better resolve conflicts and um, amongst each other and communicate and learn how to control their emotions properly. To achieve this, we need to have more guidance counselors and social workers in schools who can guide us to work out our issues and prevent any outbursts from occurring. We need to have more adults in schools who students feel like they can connect with and trust and feel comfortable with so that we can have someone who we trust to go to for our problems before they escalate. This has been a long overdue and much needed and much needed, especially as we're dealing with the impacts of social isolation from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for your testimony. Tom, are there any others for Eduardo? Not that I see. Okay, so thank you again for all your testimony and for coming. Uh, Eduardo, we're gonna leave this open till five o'clock. That's correct. Oh, actually, Andrew, I apologize, but there is one hand that's up, uh, Muslima. Uh, I believe has indicated that would like to share testimony. Sure. Uh, Maslamat, please, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Maslamat. Um, I represent um, WIVO. I'm also part of the New York City um, People's Fellowship with this with CEC. Um, I'm a Black Muslim female. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of my identity I take very seriously. And one thing I think that we need is spaces to pray. So if any of you are familiar with the religion Islam or like Muslims in general, 
you would know that like we have like assigned prayers right when there's times we have to pray and sometimes that coincides with school but there's no spaces in school right that give us the opportunity to pray recently um my some changes happened in my school and I got new administrative and I was able to talk to them and they're extremely inclusive and they've recently gave given me a space to pray along with other Muslim students in the school and that's been such a great difference in my life because that's something that like served as a burden that was kind of like a distraction from school not being able to pray knowing that it's an obligation obligation from my religion so I think that it would be helpful to a lot of Muslims if um where schools are more inclusive and more um to if schools are more inclusive and they give more spaces to pray and respect like other religions. And I wanted to add on to what Muhammad said earlier about um, Eid, like respecting everybody's religions. Cause I, not even for only Muslims, I'm speaking um, about my identity cause there's a lot of Muslims in America. And since there's so much um, oppressive factors, there's so many things that create fear within Muslims that they don't like want to advocate or they're not sure how people are going to react. So I think that's something schools need to take into consideration since um, like I go to part, I'm under DOE, right? DOE is such a big institution and there's so many Muslims. And I think that that's something we all have to factor in. And Muslim holidays like Eid, right? We don't celebrate, um, Muslims don't celebrate Christmas. We don't celebrate every other Christian or American holiday. So we only have those two holidays to ourselves. So sometimes like, um, this is for colleges, right? Colleges don't give us um, the, colleges don't um, allow um, the break for Eid. And I think that that's something that's um, unfair. I think that's something that has to be resolved. But the whole general message of what I'm saying is that I think we need to be more inclusive in like, school systems for other religions specifically for Muslims because we do have obligations we have to fulfill so I think that would be like a great addition. Thank you for that and also for sharing the good news I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's happening in your school and hopefully it's something that we see at, at many more schools so thank you. Tom Eduardo anybody else? I believe uh, we're good, Andrew. Uh, we will be uh, open until five and receive any testimony that's shared. Uh, for purposes of our government partners, we thank you for being with us today, uh, Andrew. That's it. Thank you all for a very successful hearing. It was great to hear directly from the young people on a variety of topics, but you hear a lot of the same themes repeated. So, uh, and what are maybe next year we could look at some of those topics as ICC meeting agendas. Absolutely, we will certainly do that. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everybody. Merry, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and have a wonderful and prosperous uh, 2022. It's hard to believe that the year is almost over. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, ICC members. Thank you, public. Thank you, young people, uh, for joining us. We will stay open. So those of you who would like to um, uh, stay with us, you're more than welcome to. Uh, we'll be open to anticipate if any other young people will join us until a cutoff point at 5 p.m. Thank you. Uh, Tom, thank you so much.